Good afternoon, good day, good morning, wherever in the world you are. Um, welcome to the third session in the Just Transition Research Collaboratives webinar, Justice in Low Carbon Transitions. My name is Sarah Cook. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Development at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And I'm delighted to be um, moderating this exciting panel on behalf of UNRISD and the Just Transition Research Collaborative. Um, they've organized, the UNRISD and this collaborative have organized a series of webinars of which this is the third on this topic. And with the support of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung to whom of course, we're very grateful. Today's session is part of a series, as I mentioned, um, the third in the series, in which the collaboration collaborative seeks to share some of their thinking and reflections and research on a range of aspects of just transitions. The aspects that we feel are particularly relevant to advancing social justice in climate policies and decarbonization efforts. Um, as you will have heard, if you tuned in to either of the past two webinars, and if not, I do recommend them. The idea of just transitions is rooted in an early trade union demand for public action to facilitate a transition to a low carbon economy while ensuring the costs and benefits are equitably shared, protecting jobs and livelihoods as well as the environment. And the concept of a just transition has gained broader currency in thinking about the transformations needed to achieve a sustainable future for the planet and its people globally articulated, for example, in the Sustainable Development Goals or the Agenda for Sustainable Development, but also currently in many COVID and variants of COVID recovery um, uh, plans. But as we heard also in the last webinar um, on workers and unions, there are many competing interests among and between workers across sectors and industries between global North and South. And so where do women and gender issues fit into this idea of a just transition? This is the theme for today's conversation on gender and just transitions, in which we'll explore how lived experiences differ for women in male dominated industries that are at the heart of just transition debates, but also delve into the broader issues around what kind of transitions, what kind of processes hold the potential to achieve gender justice outcomes and which of course may imply challenging deeper and pre-existing structural inequalities. So I'm joined here today by an excellent group of panelists who have a treat ahead of you, who will share some of their amazing experience, insight, reflections um, with us. After initial round of, of conversations, we're going to try and keep this rather than longer presentations and to try and keep it moving through some short, punchy, hopefully answers to a range of questions. And we will include, um, obviously, uh, questions um, from the audience. Um, so before we start, let me just make a few brief announcements about how we'll run it. The session is being recorded and live streamed via the Unraised YouTube channel, where it will remain um, available afterwards. Um, you'll see that we have enabled both a general chat um, and in the chat box, please do put any general comments or information you'd like to share, links to relevant work, et cetera, um, and a Q&A box. And the Q&A box is where please do raise your questions. Um, those questions, we will try and get to as many as we can. It may not be all of them, but you also have the option to vote on those questions. So we will try and prioritize questions that receive the highest number of votes. So please do. Um, pay attention to that. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we will also pay, um, share a very short three minute survey um, for you, three question feedback survey for you, um, if you could fill that in before the end of the session. So let me turn now to um, the subject of uh, and the panelists speakers for our session. And I'm going to start by really focusing a little bit and in my first question on addressing the lived experiences of women in different sectors and the impacts they face of the policies and changes that aim to tackle climate change, transition to low carbon growth and develop, deliver a just transition. And I'm going to turn to our first um, panelist, um, Vivian Price. Vivian is a professor of interdisciplinary studies and labor studies at California State University, Dominguez Hills. And she returned to the academy and got her doctorate after an amazing um, 
experience working in factories, refineries, and as a union electrician. She is an activist researcher and filmmaker interested in the humanistic study of gender, race, and work. And her research has focused on the history and contemporary lives of women in non-traditional jobs, especially in the building trades. And so Vivian, turning to you, what does your own experience and research tell us about how to understand the experience and views of women in these traditionally male-dominated industries in relation to a just transition? What did they see as their interests and how are they engaged? And please unmute. I'm going to share my screen here. Right. And um, I prepared some s images because I think that, you know, not everybody knows about what uh, women are doing in male dominated jobs in the fossil fuel economy. So just to preface it, um, I think there's a, a bridge that we can make. Uh, my first slide shows you a picture of women who have gotten elected into union office. This is a picture of the operating engineers officers um, not that long ago, 10 years ago. And my friend, Pat Williams and colleague is sitting in the middle of a group of uh, relatively white males. But, um, you know, women have tried to get into the ranks of union officers as well as into the jobs themselves. Uh, most of the images I'm using are from the tradeswomen archives at my university. And I also want to just say, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be among this group of women. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me. So um, next, I want to say that even now in the global north, women are fighting for fairness and respect in male dominated jobs. These are a, a few images of women. Here's a, some old pictures of me working in a refinery. Um, uh, Denise Johnson, iron worker, working in Las Vegas. This is Cindy Cruz, an operating engineer. Um, and there can be a hostile climate for uh, women on the job in male dominated uh, employment. It's hardest for black women, indigenous people of color and non-binary women. It can be challenging to get training, to have safe and sanitary workplaces, especially now under COVID and for women to just keep their jobs. So women do organize. Um, this is a, also historical material. On the left, we see uh, two groups, Winter and Electric Women, who um, worked with some of our male allies here um, to fight some of the uh, legislation that was restricting the ability for public sector work to hire folks understanding affirmative action keeping um, the idea that you want to recruit race uh, folks from diverse racial and gender backgrounds. And, um, and, and in California, that was really shut down by legislation. Uh, we still have federal legislation. This is true in Europe and in Japan, but it's always a fight to, to get this to be fairly um, implemented. On the right, there's uh, newsletters and um, flyers a way that women kept in contact and, and still do have active advocacy groups. Um, I made a film in 2006, uh, primarily from, um, in Asia. These are shots that were taken of women in um, here, Taiwan, India, Japan, and in Thailand, uh, Thailand where women actually make up a great deal of the workforce. It's not male dominated in the sense that um, there are many women, but they're not considered skilled workers. They're considered helpers, they're paid less. So at a minimum, um, you know, women want fairness and respect, a healthy uh, workplace and a place for their children to have, um, you know, to be fed and have a healthy future, whether they're in the global North or global South. And then finally, um, you know, there are, attempts to make connections internationally. I attended the Beijing Conference on Women in 1995, and this is the 25th anniversary coming up, and there have been contingents of women who've traveled to India and um, are continuing to try to build these bridges 
we're hoping to have a conference in Madrid uh, next year. We'll see how COVID behaves. But it's really important for us to look at uh, our differences, what we learn from each other, and also how we can work together. And, you know, this helps us understand what women want in a, in a just transition, which I'll address a little bit later. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much, and for keeping to time. And um, I think for really highlighting the challenges uh, of women in jobs, both in North and South, and the issues around intersectionality, as well as the issues around the internet and international connections and what they can bring. And I think that leads us to um, the second panelist who I'll invite um, is Ndivili Mukwena, who is a South African climate activist who campaigns internationally for gender justice. Sorry, no, yes. Um, in climate policy. And um, she works for Gender CC, Women for Climate Justice in Southern Africa, and is a member of the Women and Gender Constituency under the UNFCC, working on an international project, Not Without Us, um, where you work um, with local communities and women farmers on climate change challenges and struggles and adaptation strategies. Um, and I think we'd love to hear from you based on your work with rural and urban communities, with female farmers in Southern Africa, what are the concerns of affected women and their communities around these ideas of just transition and how, if at all, are these represented or addressed? Thank you so much, Sarah. And um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. And uh, I'm happy to be here and thank you for the invite. And um, yeah, glad to be amongst the formidable women of pa the, the panelists that I am presenting with today. Looking forward to learn a lot from you. Um, Sarah, if you don't mind, can I switch off my video because it tends to interfere with the connection so that uh, I can be clearly audible. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question, Sarah. Um, in response to your question, I will start by highlighting that most areas in sub-Saharan Africa are already grappling with the impacts of climate change, which are likely to intensify in decades to come. Persistent droughts in the region have caused agricultural soil to become hard and dry, delaying harvest and preventing crops from growing to full maturity. Rural communities are not spared from these harsh realities as they rely on natural resources for survival, with agriculture being one of the most vital sectors in their economies. And women in South Africa um, are contributing 60 to 80% of the agricultural labor force. And they are especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And this disproportionate impact of climate change on women magnifies existing gender inequalities. For an example, um, the problem of climate change compounds the additional challenges faced by women farmers in gaining equal footing in the agricultural market. They do not have the same access to markets and credit as their male counterparts. While making up a large proportion of the agricultural labor force, women tend to be involved in informal sectors such as communal gardens at schools or community spaces, where their contributions are not recorded in an official capacity. In such settings, women farmers receive limited government support and only a small number of people can contribute to the necessary labor. These uh, communal gardens are vulnerable to exploitation. When it is harvest time, People who wish to benefit from these gardens steal crops and their equipment too. Clearly, there are no safeguards or security for these women in informal settings. Even at this small scale, the lack of such safeguards poses a huge limitation to women's ability to sustain their livelihoods and grow their businesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, when trying to advocate for support systems and financial connections, Women often face corruption and political interference and are taken from pillar to post when seeking assistance from the government. A lack of political will from authorities to help small scale farmers, especially women, is compounded by greed and corruption within the system. 
Small-scale farmers in general receive little formal support as compared to the industrial farmers, where still women farmers face a backlash in comparison with their male counterparts. Then when it comes to agribusiness in South Africa, like in most countries all over the world, it pursues mostly monoculture farming, which is profit driven, destroys biodiversity and is carbon intensive. Now, the stark contrast between agribusiness model of agriculture and the efforts of women striving to provide healthy and safe food for their communities through alternative forms of small-scale small agriculture like uh, permaculture and agroecology farming is really demotivating for women farmers. And in many parts of South Africa, subsistence farming activities take place where there is a need to manage agricultural resources with an understanding of ecosystems and the human communi communities within. Lastly, I would like to mention that research and lived experiences have both shown that due to gendered social norms and inequalities, women often hold positions burdened by environmental change, such as water collection and smallholder farming, where they immediately feel impacts of drought or disaster. Not mentioning the care work, which is additional unpaid work, which they have no choice but to do mainly because of socially constructed systems. The ILO, ILO also estimates that women continue to be overrepresented in unpaid household and care work, often longer hours per day than men, both paid and unpaid work are considered. Climate change related impacts can heighten women's workload associated with care and household work, and also expose them to health and safety risk, as well as productivity losses. I think I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that You've covered so much in terms of both the agricultural sector and the sustainability issues. We don't often think about agriculture in terms of its carbon emissions, I think, to the, to the extent we should, um, and also the whole range of vulnerabilities facing women in these sectors. Um, and I think that leads us nicely on to, to thinking a little bit further with our next two panelists on what are the, some of the key issues, obstacles, and concerns for trying to overcome some of these difficulties, for trying to achieve gender justice in a low-carbon transition. And so my next um, panelist I'm going to turn to is Deepti um, Batnagar. Deepti is International Program Coordinator for Climate Justice and Energy at Friends of the Earth International, which I think, as we all know, is the world's largest grassroots environmental network campaigning on all of these extremely urgent environmental and social issues. Deepti has been in this role since March 2012, is hosted by Justicia Ambiental, Friends of the Earth Mozambique, has been an activist for over 15 years, previously working with the India Save the Narmada movement to fight destructive dams, dams and on immigrant rights and safe drinking water for disadvantaged communities of color in California. So Deepti, you've also, I think, worked on the energy sector, which is central to any just transition. So what do you see as some of the key gender issues for the sector um, and what are some of the obstacles? How do we move forward? Um, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, there's, uh, there's friends here today, and there's a lot of people from all over the world. Really welcome you. Thanks for being here. And thanks for, for hosting this session, which is extremely important. So as you said, Sarah, I coordinate the Climate Justice and Energy Program for Friends of the Earth International. So we are definitely looking at it, looking at these problems from that climate justice and energy lens. But we're also looking at all of the systemic issues, so many of which uh, Sister Vivian and Sister Endivile has beautifully brought up already. So when we, when we think about extractivism, we often say that women are differently impacted by a coal mine, by an oil well, by a gas extraction project. What we are trying to understand in systemic issues is not just how women are differently impacted, but why are women differently impacted? So we really need to get to the, the root of the systemic issues. It's not by accident that women are differently and often much more impacted, like the examples we heard about agriculture. It's not by accident. 
which is why in our work, we very much look at how patriarchy, how racism, how genocide of all of these years actually plays into having created the situation where we find ourselves today. Climate change isn't uh, isn't the only problem that we're facing right now. We're facing many, many interrelated crises. We're facing a biodiversity crisis. We're facing a food crisis. God knows we're facing a pandemic right now, which is because of the way, which, which is which has happened because of the way we treat, because of the way that we treat the earth. So at Friends of the Earth, we really try and look at all of these in a very interconnected way. And of course, look at women, not just as victims, but also as protagonists, as playing a very, very key role in constructing the society that we want to see. And it was so beautiful to hear uh, from Vivian about the workers in the, in the energy sector. And of course, uh, you know, when we, we stand with many of our union colleagues in calling for a just and feminist energy transition, and of course, that means looking at workers, not as a monolith, but looking at different categories of workers, which Vivian talked about, not just women workers, but black women workers, indigenous women workers, what are the, the different challenges that people are facing. And then the, the care work that Ndivile also talked about is so critical. So much of uh, this pandemic has shown us that that we need to be valuing care a lot more than we have as a society, as, as economies currently. And, and, that, and, and that's a beautiful message that has come through this, this horrific time. And we need to realize that women do carry the burden of the care work across the planet. I mean, and it's linked to extractivism as well. Who takes care of the bodies of the men whose lungs have been damaged by the coal mines that they've been working in. Even in the male dominated industries, who takes care of all of those? Who actually raises the children and who actually does all of the work that makes life on earth possible? It's that care work done by women for free most of the time. And, and we need to move to a situation where we value that work in our society. I'll stop there for now, Sarah. Thank you very much. Again, raising many of the critical issues, um, including the links between care of people, care of nature, um, the environment and human um, linkages. Um, and, and I think also the issues that have come up on, on just the intersectionality and the interrelationship between many of these problems that we're facing. So I think we've already put a lot out there. I want to welcome, I can see people coming in and onto the chat, which is great. So welcome to everybody and also making um, great comments, um, which we are taking note of. But I want to turn now to the fourth member of our panel, Stefania Baca. Stefania is a senior researcher at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. Stefania holds a PhD in economic history from the University of Bari and the title of Associate Professor in Modern History and Economic History for the Italian Ministry of Education. Her current research interests cover the environmental impact of industry in the Anthropocene, the relationship between labor and the environment, environmental justice, degrowth and commoning. So Stefania, could you please reflect on what you see as some of the key synergies or tensions between labor and the environmental movements? And what do these imply for achieving gender justice in low carbon transitions? Um, have we lost you? No, you're there. Uh, unmute, please. You're still muted, Stefan. Sorry yeah. about that. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody and all the speakers uh, who uh, have already uh, said very important things uh, before me. So um, I, um, my point of view is that the just transition should be about prioritizing care, all forms of care, not, not uh, as a social cost, as caregiving is, is currently framed, but as economically valuable work, which produces the wealth of a society. Uh, healthy people and environments are the wealth of nations. That's that's how I see it, and 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 I'm sure you you agree with me on that. So for a gender just transition, it becomes very important to ask the questions: What is care work? Uh, who are the caregivers in society? What do they tell us about the the different interconnected crises of the 
public health, of the ecology, and uh, not just the climate, um, and, uh, and of economy. So I believe this, this awareness is already developing within the just transition community in broadly speaking. For example, I have uh, recently uh, been shown a video on the LEAP website, which makes exactly the point that care work is essential work and it's also climate work. Uh, this video shows care workers in elderly homes, nurseries, hospitals, hospitals and schools in North America and arguing that care jobs are green jobs and we need more of them. I think this is a strategic starting point for a gender just transition because most of these care women, uh, caregivers are women. But we need to go further. In fact, most of the caregivers that we see in that video um, are women of color. And most of the people uh, taken care of, especially the elderly, are white people. So this reflects what one interviewee in the video talks about, that there is a serious problem of inequality and injustice embedded in caregiving. So the first point for a just transition to be just, to be gender just, I would say, is that this unequal access to care must stop. The fact that so many caregivers cannot afford care themselves means that these women of color, many of them are migrants, bear unsustainable double burdens to support themselves, their own families and communities. And this brings us to the point that I want to raise here, uh, which is the point of unpaid care labor that was mentioned before as well. And it's essentiality for a just transition, because all over the world, unpaid care work is still disproportionately done by low-income women. Women who cannot afford to pay for care services, both in the cities and in the rural areas. And most of them are women of color, as I said. Many of them are disabled women who must take care of themselves and sometimes also of dependent others. Many trans women and gender non-conforming people are also unpaid caregivers because they are economically marginalized. So a gender just transition must not only make sure of not leaving these caregivers behind, but it must actually start from them. It must ask the difficult question, who is doing the most essential work of caring and reproducing society with the least recognition and valuation? A truly just transition starts from this contradiction between, because this is lays right at the core of the socio-ecological crisis, which is ultimately a crisis of care, a crisis of reproduction of the biosphere due to a vicious and unsustainable system of economic valuation, as was mentioned before. So I would say that the main concern for a just, gender just transition must be that of not only calling attention towards care work, but also uh, to aim for a broader understanding of caregiving, not only the undervalued paid work done in public or pri private sectors, but also the hidden unpaid care work done in society. And if we are attentive enough, then we'll realize that this hidden unpaid care work is not even only domestic, but it is performed in communities and on the land and in the environment, because these are essential to people's survival and well-being. And I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Well, thanks to all the panelists for, for keeping to time and for laying out so many of the issues. I mean, we've gone from, you know, women in really male dominated industries in the North to, you know, the whole spectrum of informal agricultural vulnerable women, women who are very vulnerable to climate change and brought in the whole issue of unpaid labor care. And I think these issues around the, the, the ideas of, of reproduction of labor, um, but also of the environment of the commons of, of how we care for planet as well as people together, you know, are all underpinning the, this sort of feminist approach to the idea of just transitions. Um, and so I think, well, um, I'm going to ask all of the panel to try and respond a little bit to a second um, question, which I think will pick up on some of the issues coming up in Q&A already, maybe, um, and then we'll come to the questions from um, the floor. Um, 
So if everybody may be following on from that great laying out of issues could reflect on your own work and on what we've heard from others, what would you think are some critical issues for a gender just transition? So what would it mean either to the sectors or industries that you're involved in or more broadly, um, what does it mean locally or globally, depending on your perspectives? And again, maybe you'd also want to challenge some of the ideas and the limitations of the terminology, but, but really try and think of what, what are the key elements of a gender just transition from your perspective. So I'm going to start, take it in the same order that I started before. So we'll start with Vivian. Thank you. And I'll share my screen again. Um, if, if we think, and I, I wanna say, I, I've appreciated so much the passion and knowledge that all of the panelists have just shared. And there's, there is a lot to talk about. So um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about women in male-dominated dominated jobs or, and, um, or women who don't in jobs where they don't get credit for being workers. And I, I created this slide just to show that there are, you know, women who feel uh, differently, you know, all over the map in terms of what climate change is, what a threat it is. And this is... It, I'm speaking here for mainly for North America and possibly for Europe and a little bit um, trying to bring in issues from the global South. So some people are proud, hopeful organizers and dreamers. Some are very skeptical and worried, you know, not only about climate change, but automation, unemployment, um, the uh, overwhelming number of low wage jobs, the growth of the gig economy. Um, especially in the global south, but here in the, in the global north too, technology, um, who is going to be, what kind of technology will be brought in, um, how fast, who will be displaced. Uh, people are saying we want climate education, we want to participate in uh, the discussion about changes, we want to be decision makers. Others say, no, don't take my job, don't take my benefits, how am I going to put food on the table? Why should I trust you? What are your plans? I don't see any plans that are, are concrete in terms of what's coming next. And then, um, you know, improving uh, the planet, health is vital, no jobs on a dead planet. So, you know, we see women having really all of these issues and ideas. Um, and then in terms of what kinds of policies and um, you know, a legislation are, are, you know, important for, for women in male dominated workplaces. So I've, I've kind of got three categories, training, job placement, open to everyone, fair system of being paid and getting raises, the legal to organize and form a union, shorter hours and work week for career and life balance, um, good affordable or free child and elder care, doing work that's meaningful for community, not harmful. And here, you know, the, definitely the care question enters everybody's concerns. Um, so a, an end to gender, race, nationality bias, uh, you know, migrant workers, as well as, uh, work, you know, BIPOC workers, um, uh, trans workers, clean and safe workplaces where people actually help each other instead of try to hurt each other or compete each other or make each other look bad in a different ambiance on the job um, and in the community, right? So using non-toxic materials, looking at, you know, materials that are actually good for the planet and good for communities, and then a universal health care that is, of course, in North America, we're so backwards, not tied to a job. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. That, that's huge. I mean, I think you've put so much out there um, in terms of the different interests, particularly of women, and then some of some concrete steps. So let me move on um, to Ndivile to hear your response to the question. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think critical um, key elements of a gender just transition is about energy democracy, food sovereignty, self-determination, reinvesting in people's power and social security, especially for workers and women. 
I think the most important thing is that addressing gender equality as an integral part of climate action can contribute to achieving gender equality as well as promoting effective mitigation and adaptation measures and a just transition. Also, um, an urgent transition from a deeply unjust fossil fuel-based economy to a more sustainable, just, and equitable model of development that ensures women's human rights and gender equality is needed. Also, strong social protection policies that considers all inter intersectionalities will be critical and very helpful. There is also a need for large scale investments that enable a green restructuring of our economies that can also foster sustainable enterprises and drive job creation, skills development, improved job quality and increased incomes as well as advances in equity, gender equality and social inclusion. As you know, uh, these are the critical areas that were mentioned by the other speakers. I think a just transition to a low carbon development coupled with a political will is possible. Thank you. Thank you. That's an ambitious and very wide ranging structural and systemic agenda, which um, I think hits so many points, which I get the feeling from a lot of the questions coming up, you know, people also very much um, agree with. And I hope that the research collaborative is collecting all of these ideas and really is going to be able to, to work them into a bigger discussion of this issue. Um, so let me turn now to um, the third panelist, Dipti, to respond also to this question. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just wanted to share my screen. Thanks to my co-panelist sisters, really beautiful words. Thank you. Just to add to that, um, I hope you can all see the screen. In 2018, we developed what we call the People Power Now Energy Manifesto. We're campaigners. So we, we talk very dreamy, very ideological language, the, the world that we want to see. So we came up with these 10 demands for an energy just future and of course, we made sure that the, the gender just element is very much in there. So for example, it, it, the, the first one is system change people power now, which talks about the model of organizing and the systemic understanding of the problems we're facing and hence the solutions we want to see, which, which I talked about already. But some of the other demands, as you can see, it's not too clear on the screen, but, but I, hope you can, um, I hope you can see, and I'll also put the link in the chat afterwards. So we talk about looking at energy as a common good. It's really important that energy isn't treated as a commodity, but it's actually recognized as a human right and as necessary for people to live a dignified life. We talk about energy sufficiency, and this is a really important point for, for Northern versus Southern um, conditions because there are people on this earth who are consuming way too much energy and there are people on this earth who are consuming next to none who don't have a light bulb in their homes and they collect firewood for for cooking food so energy sufficiency is a concept which talks about balancing energy usage by everybody then we talk about finance this there is a climate debt owed by the global north to the global south and the, this, this energy transition is not going to happen without finance. So we, when we go to the international climate negotiations and all other spaces that we use, we really talk about the global North needs to pay for the finance, needs to pay for the energy revolution to happen in our countries. And we understand that in our Southern countries, some of the setups that receive the money are extremely corrupt and are problematic. Corruption happens on both ends, the North and the South, not just in the South. But we want to have this discussion in the South to say what kind of community setups, other setups do we want to create to receive these funds so that we can make sure that finance is used for people and not squandered by our governments who are often you know, working with the polluters, not with their people, accountable to the polluters, not to the people. So, so these are all of the principles we're thinking about, 100% renewable energy for all. We heard about this already, but not just renewable energy, but renewable energy that is 
climate resilient, locally appropriate and low impact? Where are the materials for the solar panels coming from? Is it the rare earth minerals coming from the Congo destroying someone else's body to create renewable energy? We need to be really careful about that. We talk about energy sovereignty and energy democracy and Davila already mentioned energy democracy. The next one is about just transition, really talking about workers, going back to what Vivian said in the very beginning. Um, yeah, so that we need to remove obstacles to progress of renewable energy. And the last one, we made sure that very much links to what we're talking about today and what is really very much key to what we are trying to do, which is that a climate just world is also one that's free from patriarchy and all system of, of oppression, domination and inequality. So these are some of the ways that we are trying to create frameworks for the energy future that we want to see, the, the feminist and, and just energy transition that we want to see, and to, to carry all of us along. I don't know if I'm out of time. You are, yes. Sarah. Yes, I you are. Okay. I stopped We'll there. come back to you at, again at the end, but thank you um, for sharing those. Um, let me turn now to Stefania, and it's great to see all the questions coming up. So we'll come after Stefania's comments to the some of the Q and A um, questions. So Stefania, yes, thanks, thanks, Sarah. I'll try to be as brief as possible. So I think that uh, my main concern uh, about the obstacles, I see both structural and cultural obstacles, and the first. Uh, big macro obstacle I see to a just transition is the fact that GDP is still calculated by excluding unpaid care work. Uh, because if all caregiving was properly accounted for, then national economies would look completely different and economic policies would have to change consequently. Then this is why we need to exercise I, uh, exercise a combined pressure upon the system coming simultaneously from different sectors of society, not only from the paid caregivers, uh, but also from the unpaid caregivers in the homes, in the city, in the rural areas, uh, because they all need to realize that the value of their work, uh, uh, the value of our work um, uh, is uh, huge and come together to claim uh, its proper recognition. We are all essential and, and our force combined can change the economy as we know it. Uh, and here I think labor organizing has an important role to play. Uh, for example, peasant and um, landless farm workers organizations such as La Via Campesina and the MST in Brazil, are already working in this direction. They are reclaiming the social value locally and globally of agroecology and, and food sovereignty, as was already mentioned before, uh, as caregiving work that is spent on the land and in the ecosystem. And caregiving work, which is a form of, of farming, a way of farming that is not hurting uh, the earth, it's not hurting people and it's not harmful to the people who work the land. So this, this to me, this is a form of, of, uh, of care. Um, however, most trade union leaderships, I believe still consider industrial work as more valuable than care work um, and industrial green jobs are as more essential than caregiving jobs. Um, and I think this is a problem because um, this is a big obstacle to uh, the transition towards uh, an economy of care, which is what we uh, really, really need. Um, caregiving workers are making their voice heard, but I think they would be much stronger. This is a, point, a key point uh, I wanted to make if uh, searching for alliance with organizations of unpaid caregivers, because together they could claim to represent uh, what I would call the forces of reproduction. So the, 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 the forces, the people that we need at this point in, in you. Okay. Uh, oops. 
Thank you. Sorry, a little technical glitch there. Um, I think now we've we've gone from really sort of the the position of particular women in particular industries right up to to very much the macro structural issues, how we value how we value work, how we value nature, the forms of GDP and what we measure. Um, so we've got so much on the table and each of these issues requires a seminar in its own right. But we're going to come now to some of the questions and answers from the panelists. I think the one um, that I think really Stefania has just addressed is really relates to the second one. How does the issue of unpaid care work by women intersect with low carbon transitions in sectors like energy or industry? It may be that, that other panelists want to add a bit more on that, but I'm going to first turn to Vivian um, and ask if you could maybe reflect from your perspectives on, on the issue that's come up, uh, the first question on sexual harassment at the workplace. Um, and can just transition be connected with other movements such as the Me Too movement? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. And it, it, I think it goes back to this whole idea of valuing women, valuing women's work, valuing each other of, um, of dismantling racism. You know, if we, if we look at, you know, sexual harassment uh, in the United States, we've tried to combat it using the law, just as we've tried to do a lot of things using the law. And that goes a certain distance. Um, civil rights law, uh, Title VII in our, our um, civil rights laws as well, is used to say women have a right to uh, fight a hostile environment. And, and um, you know, if you have a union, you, you file a grievance, et cetera but it's so limited and it's so difficult to fight. And it really does happen, have, you know, have to be about critical mass of women speaking up, of women's solidarity, of building alliances. And again, speaking to the intersectionality of race, uh, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, national you know, status, that nobody should be, be vulnerable to being bullied by other people. And that, you know, it is not in the, so we need education. We need also empowerment. Um, and it really works hand in hand with these, the other issues that we've been discussing. But sexual harassment is certainly interlinked with this idea of how, how, how do women value themselves? How are women valued in society? I think that also maybe we can move on from there. Thank you for those reflections to, to thinking about how we change the mindset of people. I mean, in a sense, that's what you're getting at. And there's a question, how do we change the mindset of people towards the right-based employment of women in the informal economy? Um, I don't know, do you, T, have you worked with women in informal economy that you would take uh, have any reflections on that question? Or maybe um, if, if not somebody else, Okay, um, I can respond to that. Um, I, I think what we're doing now, which is having um, dialogues and our advocacy work at uh, all levels, plays a major role in um, educating, informing, and transforming mindsets. And also, um, I think, instigating action, a positive action towards the right direction. So um, as we keep on discussing, raising these issues, raising awareness of what is happening, especially with uh, informal sectors and local women, rural women, and um, educating um, the, the masses, especially people who take the decision, decision makers and policy makers, that uh, as we keep on doing that, eventually, you know, um, something will be done and there can be a change of mindset. That's, that, that's my take on the question. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um... May, may I say something quickly too? Yes, yeah, please. Um, you know, I, I think Ndwele is absolutely right. And I, I wanna add that uh, labor organizing is happening, you know, whether it's in the informal sector or the formal sector and, and has a huge role to play. Um, in, in India, I saw that the Nirman Mazdor is a, a organization that 
works with the informal sector from and and brings the interests of you know fisher folk and slum dwellers and um women in construction men, women and men in construction together you know we we need people in the informal sector need the rights that the formal sector has as well so this is this must be addressed and and just as with sexual harassment labor um has a, a, a important role to play great um can I add something on that? Yes, yeah, uh, did, did you want to come in? Yes. Yeah, thanks, very briefly. I think this is a great point that uh, uh, Vivian just raised. Um, I wanted to connect this to say that I think a gender just transition uh, can only be achieved uh, if we realize that the, the sexual division of labor, so the, the prioritizing of industrial work over care and reproductive work, this is not something that is um, uh, out there in nature, that is something that is real, but it's a political construct. It's a cultural, political, social construct. And this builds on patriarchal culture, no? It builds on, and, 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 and this, and this uh, pa patriarchal construct aims at keeping uh, the working classes divided and weak. This is the basic point. So when I say that just transition, um, implies prioritizing care. I'm not saying that this means uh, uh, undervaluing other workers, uh, but to me, it means uniting uh, industrial and, and care labor in, in a common political platform, because, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, industrial workers and care workers, they all share, they all have the same needs. They need um, access to affordable and clean, food, energy, housing, education, healthcare, etc., and a healthy environment for all of present and future generations. So these are the real needs. This is real. The real needs that people of all, in all kinds of jobs, share with each other. So I think that it is really crucial to overcome this fictitious division between industrial and, and care uh, work. Thank you. I think that was a very powerful um, contribution. Um, there's a question which I'm going to ask all the panelists to think a little bit about and give a, a quick response from their perspective. It would be helpful to have the panelists describe a new policy or practice in government or industry that has been innovative transformational for gender equity in a just transition. So we've got a minute to think about that. If I just comment on a couple of the other, there are a few questions which are very specific and I think can best be answered in writing um, or online. Um, and there's also a question more generally about how gender as a term is being used. And I think, um, I would just say that I think what we're hearing is both um, people thinking about women in particular industries and sectors, you know, as women, but also the gendered structures of the economy, the inequalities that are more structural, systemic, from patriarchal structures, from the way we value um, the way the economy is structured to value certain things more than other things. So I think we've got a whole range of elements um, uh, being presented behind um, the individual responses to each particular question. I think uh, speakers can of course um, add um, anything uh, on that remark. But let me turn, maybe I could start with um, Stefania and work backwards um, do in the order. Um, on this first, what is now the first question, a particular policy or practice that has been innovative transformation or transformational. Um, or maybe if you don't have one, you'll have to say what you think would be. Um, but if you have a concrete example, that would be great. So Stefania, can I put you on the spot on that one? Yes, of course. Uh, well, uh, I can speak about a 
um, political campaign that I think I see that is uh, really crucial to this uh, struggle, to this uh, ju gender just transition. Uh, and the campaign I want to talk about is the Care Income Campaign. Uh, this is an international campaign put forward by the Global Women's Strike and um, together with the, the um, uh, Europe, the, the Green New Deal for Europe, which is a platform of um, that put together a, um, a, a Green New Deal uh, program that is alternative to the Green Deal of the European Commission. It's it's entirely based on climate justice and and gender justice. So together, these two let's say organizations have put together this this proposal for a care income. Um, I think this is really important because this is a way of concretely and materially uh, valuing, revaluing the uh, care work in society, the, especially the unpaid care work in society, and making it the core, the center of uh, um, a gender just transition, a feminist just transition. Um, uh, what what is really um, key about this campaign is the idea that uh, um, a Green New Deal, uh, as you, you may know, uh, it's based on the idea that, that we uh, need a full, a new plan, a new plan for uh, offices in a way that is beneficial to, uh, to the post-carbon transition. Now, in this broader framework, we think that care work should be given um, considered part of this full employment plan. So people should be, the, the unpaid caregivers should be paid, should receive an income for, um, which is also clean and green of uh, supporting people, but not only people, as I was saying before, also um, uh, caring for the land, caring for the environment, for the urban environment, for the rural environment, etc. So uh, we are campaigning actively for this and you can find uh, the campaign. I will put the link uh, in, the, in the chat. So if you're interested, uh, you can go and, and see and endorse the campaign. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for that uh, very informative um, action, a set of actions that have been taken. Um, Dipti, you wanted to come in on this. Yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, I wanted to share a really beautiful example with you. I have put a video link in the chat. Uh, so to give a very specific example, as the question asks, Pengon, Friends of the Earth Palestine, has been doing this amazing work, bringing solar energy to women in Palestine, very much taking into account the fact that they do not live a free state, they're living under occupation, they're living under a situation of apartheid, and they have worked with their government. So that's where the government part of the question comes in. They have worked with the, the authorities in a place where they are extremely energy scarce because, because Israel is controlling the, the energy that comes into Palestine. And they've done some amazing work in bringing energy specifically to women and specifically to Bedouin women to be able to support uh, livelihood issues. So, so they have animals and to be able to, to, to um, refrigerate the cheese for longer to be able to sell it. So it's very much livelihood related. It's very much taking, taking into account the care element. And um, th this is a really concrete example that we're seeing in front of us and trying to support as much as possible. So I've put the link, there's a, there's a beautiful video that you can watch on this. And also if I could just add, uh, there is an initiative called the Transformative Cities Initiative. I put the link also in the box. And actually our friends at Pengon, Friends of the Earth Palestine, are nominated for the award under the energy category. So it would be amazing if you like their work, if you wouldn't mind taking a few seconds and voting for them as well. So it's just one example out of many, many, but some really important work happening on the ground, taking into account the needs of women, the care work, but also needing to have, I mean, I totally forgot to mention, it's renewable energy, it's solar panels, it's not traditional energy. So this is one of the examples that we're seeing. I'll stop there. Great. Thank, thank you. Um, 
Davili, let me turn to you. And I think there's also a um, question. So you might want to give a concrete example, but you might also want to address this issue about women's women groups as part of the Green Economy Accord and how have their voices been heard and what are the challenges to hearing their voices? Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, I think I'll start by saying um, we don't have... Um, a, a concrete transformative policy in South Africa, but I would think that a, an ideal policy would be a gender sensitive policy with a bottom up approach and a strong um, security protection element, which addresses uh, unpaid care work uh, for women. Now coming to um, women's voices in the Green Economy Accord in South Africa, uh, as, an, as, as an organization, Gender CC, we're currently working with UNIDO and UN Women in trying to integrate gender into the green industry um, policies. Because um, we found that, that um, the green industry is dominated by men, it's male dominated. And um, we, uh, with the results of the research that was done, we found that um, women who are involved there it's um, predominantly white women and also women uh, of class, women in business, women uh, from a a academic institution. However, the people who are at local level, who are involved, who are engaged in informal sectors, green informal sectors are not um, involved and they are not even, um, consulted when the research is done. So as an organization or as civil society in South Africa, we're trying to bring the voices of women from the the ground level. Local women who are working on um, with water, energy, waste issues, and also food sovereignty issues, and who are uh, so much contributing to the green economy. However, they are not being uh, consulted, they are not being um, uh, recognized or acknowledged their input and the work that they do. So um, this is what we do as an organization to bring their voices to the fore to say, you know, when we, 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 we trying to integrate gender into these policies, transformative policies. We shouldn't leave out the people at local level. We shouldn't leave out the women who are at the, 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 the first hand of the impacts of uh, 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 the climate change or the disasters. Yeah, I'll stop there, thank you. Great, thank you. And I'm going to turn then to, to Vivian to see if, if you have a, one of these concrete policies, practices that have been transformative. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned in my presentation before of the, uh, the, some of the actions really that came out of the civil rights, the black freedom movement that, that transformed uh, workplaces and opened them up uh, to women and folks of color. But we've you know had series of attacks and our latest one is a, conservative majority now on the Supreme Court. Um, let's hope that we see a change in our administration. Um, but what I want, want to say is two things real quick is that, uh, you know, I've, I've been inspired by dreamers and I'm, I'm talking about dreamers, the DACA dreamers, the people who, the young children who've come into the United States without rights and have fought for their rights, who've spoken up, and these are women and men, and were able to get, um, you know, bring about a policy that gave them uh, the right to work, the right to education. Um, but we still have many undocumented students and workers who are are laboring under, you know, a, a very um, oppressive regime of, uh, you know, that that hurts both women and men. But uh, this is an example of how you can, you know, l- like the domestic workers that I've posted too, how when people don't have any rights and they come together and they demand rights and they, they create policies, um, you know, that's what I see as, as a way to initiate some of the ideas that we have all been inspired by on this panel and are working towards. 
And I'll just say one last thing is that I'm working now with the um, Labor Network for Sustainability. When we are having a, a listening project that is, uh, inter we're interviewing over a hundred workers and indigenous community organizers and um, people from marginalized communities who are disproportionately impacted by pollution about their ideas about what needs to be part of the just transition. Um, and we'll have a report coming out on that soon. And hopefully that will lead to some good policies. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've ha heard so much, both in terms of the issues laid out at the beginning of this seminar, um, webinar, and, and now some of the different ideas about what is actually happening, where people are organizing, how they're organizing, how you know different groups coming together, um, how we have to go between local and global across different regions, countries, sectors, etc. And and I think the complexity of this issue, but but also the the passion that that is being brought to mobilizing around it, and the analytics, the work you know, the research that's going on that underpins that, you know, is all here. I think we really need to be investing a lot more in this discussion and, and thinking how to take it um, forward in new and exciting ways, bringing together all the expertise that we're hearing about here and that we know of around the world. So um, let me just say we're going to have a last quick round of, of wrap up comments from each of the panelists really to think a little bit about you know how do we move forward what's the role of whether it's advocacy dialogue you know whose minds do we have to change I think we've already heard some of this from from different people and how do we start to do that so you've got one minute really to try and just provide a couple of your own concluding reflections of what the urgent things to be done um, would be um, let me also just remind the um, participants that there is a survey that's been put in the chat line. So if you can take a couple of uh, seconds, really, to fill that in as we're finalizing and wrapping up this seminar. So let me um, go back to Stefania and um, ask you to give your final concluding remark. Thank you, Sarah. Well, um, I would conclude in this way, I would say that uh, gender just transition must include three categories of uh, unpaid caregivers. And these are the caregivers uh, in the home, domestic caregivers um, that support um, not only um, people, uh, disabled people, dependent people, but they support people them, uh, in general and themselves, starting from themselves. Um, then the second category is the rural, the rural uh, uh, workers, unpaid workers uh, on uh, uh, in the rural areas. Um, and because we need to consider that this work is mostly done by uh, women and it is essential work in subsistence farming in forest fire prevention, seed savings uh, and sharing, uh, etc. And um, and this, uh, much of this has been already mentioned. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, we need to consider this as uh, essential to the just transition. Uh, and then I think we should consider also um, uh, caregiving work done in the community. Um, so beyond the sphere of the family, uh, in, the, in the neighborhood, in the community, and also in the urban environment. Uh, there are people, there are so many people who are devoting so much energies to, to um, for example, um, fight for, the, uh, for a clean urban environment uh, uh, with anti-toxic struggles, uh, environmental justice uh, struggles. That takes a lot of time, a lot of energy in organizing, in, uh, in, uh, in campaigning, in advocacy, and all this work must be recognized because it is essential to the well-being of communities and it is essential to the well-being of the environment and of the future generations. So I think these are the three categories of unpaid caregivers that I would really recommend to be more um, uh, firmly included in a just transition uh, platform. Thank you. Deepti. 
Thanks, Sarah. So to wrap up, I would say in terms of moving forward, there are four things I consider really, really important, also considering our work. So we are talking about a just and feminist energy transition. So there's one really important thing which hasn't been mentioned a, a whole lot here, which is that we need to end extractivism. We need to end the fossil fuel economy. We need to shut off the carbon emissions at source. And that's really, really important. And that makes a difference in the lives of women who are being impacted much worse by this extractivism. That work absolutely needs to be done if we want to continue living on a livable planet, if we, if we want to continue having a livable planet. The second one is the fight against false solutions. So, uh, the transnational corporations and the countries of the global north do not want to change their ways. They do not want to stop the, the emissions. So they invent all kinds of different nice sounding um, schemes to say, don't worry, we'll do all of this. We'll do net zero, we'll do nature-based solutions. And while all of those might sound beautiful, I wanted to pass to you, I've just put it in the link. We released the report yesterday along with the Demand Climate Justice Campaign to show how net zero can be extremely damaging and extremely, um, it, it can really divert from the work that needs to be done and how corporations and, and Northern governments are actually using it to continue business as usual. I think this is another thing we really need to think about because as so many of you have said, those lands, those fields, those forests are, are held by women most of the time using those resources to keep their communities alive. And the companies and, and others want to go in there and grab those resources from them to be carbon sinks. And, and that's really important to fight against. Thirdly, really, really quick, I, I know, Sarah, I can see you getting a bit tense. We need to reclaim democracy. Um, uh, Vivian, you talked about it. I'm in all solidarity with people in the US right now. There is an undermining of our democratic structures happening everywhere in the world. And we really need to fight back because our governments need to be accountable to us, the people and not to the polluters. And we really need to do that very, very consciously. And the very last thing is about the United Nations. We use those multilateral spaces. They're extremely important because that's the voice. Every country has one voice and that's a really important space, but those spaces are facing a huge amount of corporate capture and we need to fight back. And I want to appreciate the work of UNRISD, which, is, which has been really, really good, but we need, to, we need to be in those UN spaces and fight that corporate capture. Thank you. Thank you. Some great points you put out there. Um, really. Okay, um, thanks, Sarah. Moving forward, I think we need to develop new and inclusive ways of working to manage change. And that can safeguard the environment for present and future generations. That can also er eradicate poverty and realize social justice. Um, we also need to address misogynistic and patriarchal divisions of power in just transition discussion. Um, that is a must. If we change the system without dismantling patriarchy, we allow the system to continue oppressing women. Also funders need to provide flexible co-funding and fund differently and better. Just transition needs proper integration from local, national, to regional and international levels. There is a strong need for global solidarity and multi-level cooperation. I think it is time for concrete action and civil society must be better at collaboration within its own ranks and at speaking with a unified voice. Thank you. Great, thank you. And finally, um, Vivian, you have the last word for the panel on the panelists. I I want to say thank you to all the panelists and, and to you, Sarah. I, I think this has been a terrific webinar and uh, I've been inspired by your words. And I'll just say two things. One is, let's not underestimate people. We need to find ways to talk to folks about things they really care about and not assume that if they're fossil fuel workers, that they're not going to um, see a, the need for change, for example, but we need to work together to find those answers of, of how we create an economy that works for everybody. And the second point is we cannot have inequality in the world that leads to this kind of profit making off of people's lives. And if we, that is really our ultimate um, 
challenge is how do we find ways to peacefully transform the world so that the rich don't get richer, that the corporations don't have control over policy. Uh, we need to democratize uh, the ways that we create plans for the worlds and, and implement them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think those, those concluding words really help to, um, you know, give us uh, well, words of wisdom and thoughtfulness about how, how we move forward as individuals, who we work with, how we try and create a space for dialogue on these issues. Um, they are complicated. There are so many different issue, interests among different groups. Everybody, you know, has their own individual interests. They have their sector, they have their country, they have their environment. How do we create the spaces in which we can really have a conversation. There are also disciplinary divides around this. And we had a recent um, workshop also in my institute and it, you can find some background information online. We'll have reports soon. Really trying to bring together some of the dis disciplines, the feminist economists, the ecologists, the people working at these issues, coming at them from different disciplinary perspectives and with different priorities over, you know, are we talking about anthropometric, anthropocentric approaches versus ecocentric approaches? How do we reconcile some of these different debates, different ways of looking at the problem, as well as the more sectoral, industrial, individual interests that we've heard about today? So I think there's a huge amount happening at the moment. I think the debates around COVID and the response to COVID, the recovery plans, the potential for so-called new green deals and what do they look like, the feminist recovery plans that many um, groups in countries, within countries are pushing around these issues. These are all opportunities where I think we have spaces that will close again quite quickly as countries do revert to their usual more carbon intensive responses. But there are opportunities. How do we come together and make use of those and, and take advantage of where we have space? I think we've heard so much here today in the last um, 60, 75 minutes. Um, we've come to the end of our time. So it really is remains for me to thank um, the panelists, first of all, for absolutely amazing interventions, keeping to time, putting so much out there for us to think about. All the participants, there was a very active participation in the chat as well. And I think a lot of information has been shared. And I really hope that we are able as a group to bring this together and to take it to a next step. And so thank you, everybody. Thank you to UNRIS. Thank you to the funders, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, and we look forward to, to the next in this series and also this will be online for people who maybe weren't able to see it or want to go back and, and really grapple with some of the ideas that have been presented. So thank you again to everybody and have a good day. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone.